Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to this THE student webinar about funding your degree in the US. I'm Jamie with THE student and I'm joined today by Marshall Hauserman, Director of Enrollment at UIC Global. We hope that today's session will give you some good sound advice on preparing for studying in the US, planning financially for your degree. Um, and today's event is also sponsored by Prodigy Finance. Later, we'll be joined by Molly from Prodigy Finance. She's gonna talk a little bit about their services, options for lending, should you choose to do so, and a lot of the details and protocols around that. So we obviously have a very full session today, and we hope that you'll leave with a better understanding of where to look for funding options and how to financially plan for your education. We will, of course, be happy to answer your questions, so please do drop them into the Q&A. Um, and without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Marshall, before we jump in, do you wanna just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Marshall Hauserman, and I'm Director of Enrollment for UIC Global, which is the International Student Enrollment Program at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, we are Chicago's number one public research university, uh, and I have been in this position for the last four years. Prior to that, I've held other admissions positions related to um, credential assessment, admissions policy, uh, and just overall helping international students find their foot and their destination in the United States. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks, Marshall, and thanks for being here today. Um, your expertise will be incredibly helpful and important for the students who are here. And I want to start by just talking a little bit about why studying in the U.S. is still a valuable and worthwhile investment for students. I think it can be difficult, especially this year, for students to think about spending so much money on studying at a U.S. university uh, when there's a lot of uncertainty around what the campus experience might be like, whether or not they'll be learning on campus or virtually. Um, and so I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about why there is still so much value in that investment. Sure. Um, well, one of the things that struck me as we were talking about this previously, and that, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this question uh, just in general lately with a lot of questions around the pandemic and whether I should still study internationally or study in the United States. And uh, it's interesting that uh, this morning, even, I opened the Harvard Business Review article that was shared with me again. Uh, from about two years ago that just explains part of the reason that studying internationally is so important. Uh, it helps us break down barriers uh, and preconceived notions of other people and other cultures. Uh, it can help motivate uh, or kickstart someone's career. Uh, those who study internationally um, often find that their career options are much uh, wider much larger, they're casting a larger net. Uh, for students specifically to study in the United States, I think the value of the US uh, university education system, uh, you know, the quality of a US education, what doors that can unlock across the world uh, is still sort of the highest bar that's set in the world. Uh, but also, you know, it does open up a lot of opportunities for students when they're thinking about future employment. And I think that's one of the one of the great benefits for international students is that ability to uh, you know, immerse yourself in a university world-class education while also getting the experience to uh, intern with multinational companies. Some of them which may have um, offices in your country, in your home country, and you can return and you've made that connection here in the United States or it leads you to doors wide open of continuing on in your life in the United States or going to another country and thinking about another global destination uh, like London or Singapore or wherever that is. But I think the US and being a part of that education can really open that door. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've talked a little bit in, in earlier sessions this week, too, just about some of those things that you can't really put a price tag on, you know, building a network and, and getting that professional experience. I mean, it is, of course, about 
um, the degree that you will earn and the university that you will attend, but it's also just about all of those intangible experiences and things that happen um, as a result of sort of leaving your comfort zone, experiencing another culture, being surrounded by students and faculty members from different backgrounds. You can't really put a, a price on that. That's right. Well, that's right. And in the United States, I think the one thing that's different than almost every other place in the world, having done years of admissions assessment, is the ability for students to really uh, change their minds, uh, explore new opportunities. Students often come into a degree in the U.S. thinking, I'm going to be a computer engineering major and end up leaving with a journalism degree. Or, uh, you know, they think they're going to be a medical doctor and they end up having a real passion for graphic design. Those are all things that students in the United States get to explore, and they get to explore them pretty easily compared to a lot of other countries in terms of not having to start completely over. You could be in your second year of an undergraduate degree and shift gears and still most likely finish in four years. Uh, that's not necessarily something that undergraduate students get an opportunity to do in other countries. And I think that's one of the other, uh, what you're talking about, you can't put a price tag on it sort of benefit. Yeah, absolutely. That flexibility is, is so key to the U.S. experience. Um, now that we've talked about why it's a valuable investment, we have to switch to the maybe not so nice topic of what that investment actually is and what the cost is for students to study in the U.S. And I think, I mean, there's no sense in, in shying away from it. The U.S. often, um, you know, students are deterred from considering studying in the U.S. deterred from considering studying in the U.S because it's, it can be really expensive. And I think one of the mistakes that students can easily make is forgetting to sort of plan for and consider all costs associated with studying abroad. And we are, of course, going to talk about sources of funding and ways to help supplement that cost. But I think we first need to sort of identify what are the costs associated with studying in the U.S.? What are all those little bits and pieces that students need to remember to really think about before they embark on this journey? Yeah, uh, the first thing that I would say to that is from the very first uh, time you're opening an application and thinking about applying to a university, uh, you start with application fees. Uh, have you prepared that there's those miscellaneous fees? It's not just the tuition later on, but it's application fees. It may be getting a, an international evaluation of your study. That, that's an additional cost, depending on the university you choose. Uh, those sorts of things. Then, of course, you have to plan not just for tuition, uh, but tuition and fees, uh, those, those fees that are associated with studying at a university, um, including library access and the recreational center and, uh, you know, funding student organizations so that you can have these really important organizations to make professional connections and social connections. Um, but then students also need to think about their housing, uh, their food, um, and whether they, have, whether they have a budget for going to the movies with friends or going to the art museum. In Chicago, we have the Art Institute of Chicago one of the most famous art museums in the world. And, uh, you know, uh, it costs money to attend the Art Institute. It's not a free endeavor. So those are all things that I think people sometimes often overlook. And they say, well, I have a budget for the $30,000 or $20,000 or whatever it costs for the tuition. And they overlook. And, and often they bundle that with the housing plan and the dining plan. So that's all been settled. But then we, we've encountered students who say, I don't have any money to go out with my friends. I don't have any ability to leave my dorm room or not eat in the dining hall. And it's something that I think people should think about setting aside money for. Um, or, you know, we'll talk about ways to fund those sorts of things in a, in a minute. But of course, getting a part-time job on campus so that you can do those things. There are ways to do that, right? Yeah, yeah, and I think as we just talked about a few minutes ago, so much of the experience of studying in the U.S. is also about being able to experience the culture and spend time with 
um, you know, friends that you've met from other backgrounds and, and, and learn from them and have those social experiences. And so the last thing you want is to end up on a US campus feeling like you can't partake in any of those things. I think the other thing for students to remember, which Marshall, you and I talked about before the session is that your degree isn't just one year in most cases and that you really need to think about, you know, that total cost. Okay, after the first year, I've still got another couple of years, depending on master's or undergrad or, you know, what type of program you're in. Yeah, that's absolutely important. Uh, for undergraduate students, it's really important to budget for those four years. And in those four years, the tuition, the fees, how much your housing is going to cost, knowing that housing prices can change, having a little bit of a buffer um, there so that if you're thinking, oh, well, the, uh, my, my child's going to live in the residence hall for four years, um, but the residence hall this year was $5,000, could be $5,500 two years from now, making sure that there's maybe a percentage, a 3% buffer or so probably in your budget would be good. Um, for graduate students, I think too often we see that students plan for the first semester and think that they're going to guarantee themselves some sort of on-campus waiver position, whether it's a teaching assistant position or a research assistant position, and they don't have the funds available. And if those don't, and if they don't qualify for that assistantship or they don't achieve it, then they end up in a position where they can't afford their tuition. One of the things that can really hamper a student's uh, experience is worrying about money. And it, it's for anyone, domestic or international. And for international students, we see that when, you know, they have the tuition money, but now they're a little short, and they're worried about how they're gonna pay for the next semester, or they have an outstanding bill and it affects their grades and other, and other aspects of their life um, negatively. It's really important for them to think about that. One other thing to additionally think about as part of the funding that we haven't talked about is travel. Uh, and in, in a couple ways. Uh, one, if you're planning a four-year study, you're probably going to want to visit, you, you as parents would want your child to visit your child's going to want to visit you. You're going to want to travel back and forth, perhaps, um, as a parent. Uh, graduate students will still probably want to return maybe for a couple weeks over the winter break or something of that nature. And it's important to have a budget for that because travel isn't always inexpensive. Uh, and not just travel back home, but travel within the United States, which I think is a, another great benefit of studying in the United States. Uh, Chicago is a wonderful city, and I think it's a great landing place for a lot of students who get to experience the big city, the urban education, uh, but they, I still think they should go explore downstate Illinois. They should go visit farm country. Maybe they should go visit New York and Los Angeles and other parts of the United States and experience how many different cultures really make up America. Uh, that's perhaps something that you want to budget for as well. Yeah, and I think, Marshall, I want to highlight a point that you made just about, we talked about this in a session yesterday, that, you know, your financial well-being and, and the ability to, um, you know, really have planned and be thoughtful about your spending and um, not have any sort of surprises when it comes to costs, that financial well-being is so intrinsically linked to your overall well-being and your ability to, as you said, focus on your studies, enjoy the experience, make friends, have a very robust social experience, um, you know, get an internship. All of those things really are connected to you know, your overall well-being and your, your financial well-being and stress about money is a very real and serious thing that what we would like to do is help you avoid that by helping you, you know, really plan for, for all of this. So we don't want this to, to seem doom and gloom about the cost. And I think now is the perfect time no, not at all. <laughs> to pivot and just talk about what are some of the options for funding and how can students explore some of those options that might help subsidize the cost of studying in the U.S. 
Yeah, so of course, first and foremost, probably you want to determine if you have the funds or your family has the funds to support your education. But on top of that, there are other things to consider. And though international students that require that are not U.S. citizens or permanent residents don't qualify for federal financial aid, there are lots of ways that universities in the United States have uh, scholarships or need-based assistance for international students. What I mean by that is you should check the universities that you're interested in and intrigued by as to what kind of merit-based scholarships they award, whether they have those available for international students, uh, whether you're you know, earning the grades and, uh, and achieving the qualifications for, for being in the running for those awards. Uh, and some some universities are have need based assistance or even for international students they will meet some of the uh, the need uh, that a family has to support their education uh, that's less common much less common than merit based um, but merit based definitely is an an option for students. I would also say don't necessarily, when you're searching universities, go just by the sticker price, uh, as we call it, of the tuition and fees of the university. Really look at what grants and scholarships and other financial opportunities they have. Uh, you know, as someone who studied, who works at a public university now, but studied at a private university before, can tell you that private universities often look more daunting to international students because of the cost that's posted, when in reality, they may be able to help supplement education to put them on an equal footing with, with in terms of final cost with public universities as well. Uh, the other things that students can look for besides the university assistance in terms of scholarship opportunities, uh, they can look outside the university. Uh, I know you're going to have a uh, prodigy talk in just a second. Um, there are some great student loan opportunities. There are some that, you know, students might want to read through very carefully and make sure that they understand the terms and conditions. There are others that are very competitive for international students uh, that, that really do in many ways mirror what federal loans are for domestic U.S. citizens. Um, and they can be a great opportunity to supplement your funding. Uh, for some students, it's looking within their government. Does your government offer sponsorship capabilities for you as a student? So, you know, governments in places like the Middle East, uh, in the Gulf states, uh, United, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, we're, we're all very familiar with those in the United States. But there are other sponsorship schemes. Uh, and, and plans for students. Uh, there's some in Central America and in Latin America. Uh, Ecuador has a program for international students. We have some of those students at UIC. Uh, we see students from Indonesia and Thailand that have government funding opportunities. So seeking out whether the government um, has sort of those sort of funding opportunities as well. And the last thing they'll say is there are external resources for gathering sort of that information. There are websites uh, like internationalscholarships.com, but there's also uh, tools for that, like with the College Board, uh, this sort of session, T the TAG um, funding and Times Higher Education. There's uh, uh, UNESCO has a database. Uh, so if those UNESCO is part of the United Nations, uh, and they have an opportunity for students to search what kind of international funding and financing is available as well. Yeah, and Molly, we are going to turn to you in just a few minutes to talk in detail about some of these things a little bit more. But I want to also mention, like, don't underestimate the power of stacking small scholarships as well. I think particularly in the U.S., students can kind of see the the sometimes big price tag at a university and go, well, if I don't get $25,000, I can't do it. But actually, 
five thousand dollars here and two thousand dollars here and another five from another organization that can add up really quickly to put a, a fairly decent dent in that overall cost and i think um sometimes because we see that total cost and then you might see options for scholarships that are lower amounts students might think well it's not even worth it for me to apply for that scholarship because it's it's so minor in the overall cost, but actually those things can really add up. Yeah, I, I would also add that, you know, thinking about years two through four, or if you're if you're an undergraduate student or if you're a graduate student, uh, you know, I would caution against relying on these things, but perhaps if thinking about ways to save money in the future or those things that, that can help with your costs. Uh, students becoming a resident assistant. If you become a resident assistant in a dormitory residence hall on campus, you probably have eliminated your housing costs. Uh, there are <clears throat> there are other opportunities on campus that may eliminate some other fees. Uh, you may get free gym membership and not have to pay the rec center fee at some universities if you work in the rec center. Uh, there are just other things. There are organizations on campus on many campuses, the Student Activities Board, Center for Student Involvement, that helps students with uh, free tickets to baseball games, Chicago Bulls basketball, uh, Art Institute. Uh, there are ways to navigate those. Look at the university and see what kind of activities they have that they help finance for students that you then know you can have those other experiences as well. Um, those are just uh, you know, some yeah. some of the examples that I think students should take advantage of. Yeah, and you even mentioned earlier also working part time that working part time on campus is an option for international students under their visa. And um, again, I think sometimes students think, well, that's not going to be a huge amount of money, but it is hugely helpful when it comes to just even helping with living costs and giving you a bit more flexibility in terms of those social activities and things like that. I mean, you just it, it can help you just feel a little bit more comfortable with when you want to go out with your friends and things like that. So I, I think the overall message is don't underestimate all those little bits and pieces, the savings and also the, the small awards or earnings that can help help make a big big difference in the overall cost when they when they add up that's right i would caution against anyone using a part-time employment to say that's how i'm going to pay for um, my tuition this semester but um if you're if you're getting by on the tuition and housing and you want to supplement being able to go out with your friends uh, having those experiences um, and paying for other things part-time employment is definitely an option for international students and is something that I, I, I see a lot of international students working on UIC's campus. Uh, it's great. It's one of the greatest things about going to Starbucks sometimes in the morning uh, when we were when we've been on campus is seeing some familiar faces from when they first arrived at orientation and knowing that they're they're settled in and having a great uh, they have a great work opportunity, but they're also then having other opportunities because they have that paycheck. Yeah, well, Marshall, thank you so much. I think you've done an excellent job outlining how students should think about total cost of attendance, but also giving some great resources for them to look at scholarship and funding opportunities and some very reassuring words that, you know, this is all possible and, and don't be deterred from considering studying in the US just because of the cost because I think one of the other things we maybe sort of touched on but should really put a finer point on is that the cost of studying in the United States varies significantly depending on the institution and where in the country it's located and the cost of living. Cost of living in Los Angeles or in New York City is completely different than the cost of living in, you know, the Midwest in a more suburban or rural setting. So, um, you know, just encouraging students to really explore all of their options and to understand that there's a, a very wide variance in terms of cost um, across the U.S. Absolutely. And look at look at those universities that have been rated with best value. So what kind of money are you paying in tuition? What are the resources you're getting? There are a lot of universities that are not high priced um, that can provide a really world-class education 
for students. And they may be in smaller towns and they may be in uh, other parts of the United States. Um, we often think of only New York and LA and maybe Chicago, but there are definitely other parts of the United States that welcome international students that have an opportunity for a really great education at a much lower cost. But also calculate just in general, your total overall cost. Think about the scholarship, what scholarship can be provided. Don't necessarily go by just the sticker tag when doing your research. Don't let that deter you either. <clears throat> Think about what the, what the university might award you. The last really quick piece of advice is if you're finding that you're just a little bit of a gap, maybe it's a thousand dollars, it doesn't ever hurt to reach out to the university if it's really your choice and say, you know, this is my number one choice. You've, I've been so grateful to receive this merit-based award, um, but my gap is maybe this much. And just see if there's additional opportunity. Um, don't be surprised if it's a no, but some universities want to see that demonstrated interest in order to maybe supplement that scholarship opportunity. Absolutely, and it never it never hurts to ask, of course. Um, well, Marshall, thank you so much. That's been incredibly helpful. And I'm gonna hand it over now to Molly with Prodigy Finance. And Molly is gonna get into some of the finer details um, of the lending process and, and what they do at Prodigy. Molly, I'm gonna toss it over to you. Great, thank you. And thank you, Marshall. I think you have given us a great framework. Um, and I'm just gonna build on that slightly. Um, first, I suppose I should introduce why I'm talking on this topic. Um, so I have a um, background in international admissions myself. Um, so I'm also passionate um, about that impact and, and certainly believe and want to double down on a lot of what you've heard from Jamie and Marshall about that value of um, an overseas degree. Um, so um, after working for Australian institutions, Irish institutions, and US institutions, I found an organization called Prodigy Finance uh, who does international student loans. And so um, with my background in international um, admissions, I wanna talk to you about all the options out there. And I am gonna talk a little bit about that lending option. I think we have, from what I understand, quite a diverse um, audience, which is fun. Um, that means that some of you might just be starting to explore, and some of you might be in the application process. Um, I'm hoping to hit on things and tactics that will be helpful for, for all. Um, and so with that, I'm going to share some slides so that if you are further in the journey, you can uh, maybe read more. And if you're just new to this journey and considering a degree in the US, um, you can kind of take in uh, the base message. Um, so let some of this wash over you if you are new to the journey. But what we are aiming for in kind of teaming up with Time Tire Ed is that we are empowering you with more information so that you can know your options in the holistic way and not shy away. Um, Jamie did a great job saying it can be scary talking about, okay, it sounds great. It looks great. I want to go, but how am I going to get there? And so let's not shy away from that. Let's talk about it today. Maybe it's your first time. Um, so with that, I'm going to quickly just share um, my screen here. Um, so uh, Prodigy has been around 13 years. We're talking about this topic because we're passionate that international students should have an option to fund their degrees um, through a student loan that is fair that gives them um, a great option without taking advantage of um, them with financial uh, terms that are not, advanta not advantageous. Uh, so we funded about 20,000 students to date. It's my pleasure to work across 800 graduate schools um, and we have funded 150 different nationalities. So what are we gonna talk about? Let's talk about what it is like and how degrees are funded. So you actually heard a lot of this teased um, in what we were just hearing from Marshall, but in the US, if we look at the statistics, and by the way, these are available um, by Open Doors, which is a US um, based organization that really looks at you know, the uh, transfer of education and student mobility. So you can see if we generally summarize 
how students pay for their degrees. So what is the average student doing to fund their US degree? And you can see overall, um, out of the amount to go to fund their US degree, which might be tuition, it might be living expenses as well, and fees. So about 60% of those students are going to be self-funding. So 60% rather of the proportion of money going there is going to be um, funded by the students and or the students' family and network. Whereas 20% um, are getting some sponsorship from their employment. Um, and then you're seeing um, scholarships coming from both institutions as well as from foreign government entities. These do vary by length. So you'll see a great difference, for example, in how much scholarship is available for a graduate international student on average versus a undergraduate. So if this is of interest to you, you can find this um, kind of at this link just down here um, and you can dive into more. So for students who are funding their degrees um, and who are self-funding that 60% of their degree, um, there are a few different options. Uh, so depending on your own country, um, there could be domestic bank options. So um, an option for you to get an education um, loan that may or may not exist in your country, but it's certainly something to explore. You can find out what those terms are like, and you might be able to either get a loan yourself or use a co-signer um, in your own country. If that's not available, um, there are certainly banks in the US, private banks, um, so outside the federal government option, that would lend if you had a US co-signer. So this is considered a co-borrower. Um, some lenders might require collateral if you are um, looking to study abroad. Um, however, there are some entities, and Prodigy Finance is the, the leader in this and why we exist, um, is to really provide an option and disrupt that a little bit so that if you don't have a US co-signer, if you don't have a home bank option that's fair, that you will have an option uh, to fund yourself. Um, and so that is why Prodigy is around. I don't wanna hit on too much of this because I think Marshall did a great job. Um, however, just a basic timeline for you to familiarize yourself with. Your admissions letter will come first you might get a scholarship offer, like a merit-based scholarship offer, like Marshall mentioned, right off the bat. Uh, but even if you do, you should consider doing your research. Frankly, you should do your research on this even before you consider um, to understand what other options exist. Do they have teaching assistance or residence assistance, which we heard mentioned? Fellowships, scholarships, how can you um, apply for all of those and put yourself best out there? Even though I work for a student loan provider, I always advocate, as does everybody who works at Prodigy Finance, please, please exhaust all your options for scholarships, fellowships, prior to considering uh, the rest of your funding plan. It's a great place to set yourself up. If you're applying early, you'll have your best chance to get those scholarships as well. Next, you should really consider if there's a gap that exists beyond that. And for many international students, as we looked at those stats, there are. So how are you and your family planning to fund that gap? You make a financial plan based on your own uh, attack plan and then can feel confident depositing. Last, and this is really only for those of you who are more uh, far along perhaps in your journey, you might be familiar that um, a funding plan is required to submit to your US institution. This is so they know that you're set up for success in paying your tuition, yes, but also paying your living expenses during the duration of your first year, and frankly, have a plan beyond that. So because of that, I would recommend that um, you really do uh, look at this holistically and not wait until after you've got that letter of admissions to piece together your funding plan. Good news, you're here today, you're already educating yourself on this, and putting a great foot forward to, uh, to progress that plan. So um, that proof of funding is really required about the time your deposit is. And that proof of funding will come with an I-20 form in the US. Um, really, that's a fancy term. that just means it's the school reviewing and making sure you have a financial plan that makes sense. If you're borrowing from a lender like Prodigy Finance, you can use a loan confirmation letter. 
if you're using personal savings or scholarships, um, they're gonna ask proof of that. So whether that's a bank statement from you and or your family, or your proof of scholarship, fellowship, government funds, um, and or your loan confirmation letter from your lender. Last and certainly not least is the visa appointment, which also will require you to show those financial documents. Some key considerations, if you are considering a loan, are things like interest rate. Um, also, how is your education loan structured? So what are the repayment terms? And I know this might get a little more in detail than a lot of the audience is ready for now. So let this kind of wash over you if you are earlier in your journey. You also should consider fees because sometimes we find that banks, um, whether it's domestic lenders um, or education lenders, do have fees associated with them. For Prodigy, for example, it's a one-time administration fee. So it's only charged one time um, and it is our only fee. For other entities, there might be some hidden fees, and that's always something to take into consideration, as is foreign exchange conversion um, if you or your family are planning to do financial traction, transactions overseas. Those can add to costs. Also think about disbursement. Prodigy Finance, we work directly with universities themselves, so we actually disperse to the financial aid office, just like a U.S. lender does, um, but that's fairly unique. So um, if you're not uh, going with someone like Prodigy who works directly with a university, then consider how you're gonna get that funding there. And that, um, that uh, can be part of your funding plan as well. Um, I'm gonna skip over this one in the sake of time, but if you are looking uh, also to, uh, to apply and to go in the US, one thing you might hear a little bit about is building a local credit score. Certain entities, Prodigy Finance being one of them, will help you build a U.S. credit score, which can really help uh, you as far as getting an apartment, renting down the line, getting a credit card down the line. Um, so that's another thing to consider, but probably only for our most progressed candidates in the audience. In short, we're here and building on what you heard from Jamie and Marshall to empower you to explore your best funding fit. Don't shy away from that idea that funding your degree um, you know, is, is, is scary and we don't want to talk about it. You're already here. You're doing great. So keep that going. Um, think about your full funding options. Clearly think about that cost of attendance. And I think it's some great tips coming out of where you're applying to school, how you're applying to school came out of the panel today. Think about your return on investment and your best fit beyond the rankings. Um, all of that can really go into making sure that you're applying to and setting yourself up for your best funding fit in the U.S. I'm going to skip over Prodigy um, information here for the sake of time, other than to say for those of you who might be in the stage of applying, please know that entities like Prodigy Finance have an online application that is free. It can help you build a funding option without requiring you to, uh, to, of course, be attached to anything. It's free, it will build an option, and that is it. You can be empowered with that, leave it where it is, and then hopefully get the full ride scholarships uh, out there and or a lot of those funding opportunities by stacking them like Jamie recommended so that maybe you don't need an education loan. There's so many resources out there for you, but you're already here at the Times Higher Ed Funding Week. So hats off to you, keep that going, empower yourself, and please know um, that uh, Prodigy Finance, along with all of your, your, your support networks across their Times Higher Education and wonderful institutions would love to help you navigate how you can fund this very exciting investment. Molly, thank you so much. That was great. I think you've done a great job of just making it really clear and, and taking sort of all of the, the big scary questions out of the process. Um, we are just about out of time. We have a couple questions from the audience that I just want to make sure we address um, specifically related to Prodigy. One is around um, interest rates and one is around repayment terms. So can you just give us any insight on how that works with Prodigy and what students should be aware of related to those two items? 
Yes, absolutely. So our interest rates range based on the student's application, which is an online 20 minute application. Um, it's free and you can instantly find out what your interest rate would be. But our average interest rate um, is going to be about 7%. Um, and that will be, in, uh, that will be uh, charged over your term, which can be anywhere from seven to 20 years based on your profile and also which term you choose. One important thing about Prodigy is that um, you're never locked into the full length of your term. So you, um, while studying, you have a grace period, you're not making payments then, and you're not making payments six months after your graduation date. From then, you can start chipping away at that, and if you uh, so choose, and actually 50% of our students settle their entire education loan with Prodigy in under four years. So um, we do find that students um, are getting that return on investment that you heard Marshall and Jamie mention, and are able to pay back their Prodigy loan quite soon. That's great, thank you so much. Molly, thanks again for your expertise and for all of that very clear and helpful information. Students can, of course, find more information on timeshighereducation.com slash student and obviously directly through Prodigy as well. Um, we have loads of info up on our site around funding week, all kinds of questions answered about funding. So please do stop there and, and take advantage of those resources. Um, again, a big thanks to Marshall and Molly for joining us today. And we will see you all next time at another THE student event. Thank you.